Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. I'm going to read more of our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. And as you can see, this is the book without the cover jacket on it. And they actually printed on here, A Case Against Nuclear Power Plants. I guess that's the subtitle. Um, I'm going to get right to it. We're on page 50. And let me read the last paragraph that I ended with so we have some continuity here. I think I'm going to continue to do that also. If only the rads that are absorbed matter, why bother about external versus internal radiation or about the differences from one radioactive element to another? A. External versus internal radiation. The various radioactive elements produced by uranium fission emit beta rays of varying speeds. The, body, the speed determines how far the beta ray can penetrate into the body. Thus, a radionuclide may emit only very low speed beta rays that don't even penetrate beyond the layers of the skin. The internal organs are safe when such radionuclide is placed outside the body. However, the damage to skin from such an external source can be severe. On the other hand, if the same radionuclide were ingested with radioactivity contaminated food or water and distributed uniformly throughout the body tissues, all organs can be irradiated by it. By it. Let me show you this picture. And remember folks, we now know that 76% of all nuclear power plants are leaking radiation. We also have six million people drinking tritium tainted, I mean uh, uranium tainted water along with what was the other one? Nitrates. So I'll read you what this says about that picture. This rat is one of a group of experimental rats that were exposed to a single dose of beta rays. Six months after irradiation, the group of rats began to develop skin tumors. Tumors are still appearing at 14 months after a single dose of beta rays. Chance of tumor rises with radiation dose. Hmm. The case is the same for x-rays and gamma rays. Low energy x-rays or gamma rays from outside the body may not affect a deeply situated internal organ. On the other hand, if the radionuclide emitting those same x-rays or gamma rays is taken into the body, it can affect any organ its x-rays or gamma rays reach. B. Concentration in organs. We must recall that the radioactive elements produced in a nuclear reactor behave almost precisely as do their non-radioactive counterparts. For example, radioactive iodine-131 behaves chemically and biologically just as does stable, non-radioactive iodine. But chemical elements do differ from each other in how they distribute themselves once they are inside the body. Iodine is interesting because the thyroid gland has a spe special affinity for iodine. As a result, thyroid accumulates far, far more iodine than an from an ingested dose than any other body organ does. The thyroid uses iodine to manufacture its major active hormone, thyroxine. The radioactive form of iodine, iodine-131 is one, behave just like non-radioactive iodine would when it's taken in with food, accumulating preferentially in the thyroid gland. As a result, that tissue receives a far higher radiation dosage in rads from the decaying radioactive iodine than any other tissues of the body do. Naturally, radioactive iodine is a major biological, has its major biological effects on the thyroid gland compared with its effect on other cells in the whole body. There is nothing special about the radioactivity of iodine-131 that makes the thyroid gland vulnerable. Precisely the same injurious effect to the thyroid gland could come from x-rays out of an x-ray machine or from a source of external radioactive cobalt. Only the rads that accumulate in the thyroid gland cells during a particular time matter in assessing possible damage. 
If half the radiation comes from the outside, as from an x-ray machine, and half from ingested iodine-131, the injury to the thyroid cells will be the sum of the rads delivered by both radiation sources. I guess that means that we really need to make sure we don't get that many uh, x-rays. Tell your dentist no. <laughs> Next year. Certain chemical elements taken into the body along with food or water do not concentrate in specific tissues or organs. Instead, they distribute themselves throughout the body. Cesium, produced abundantly in its radioactive form, cesium-137, by uranium fission, does precisely this. It is said to produce whole body radiation. Again, the radiations from cesium-137, radioactive iodine-131, or any other radionuclide, or x-rays from a machine are comparable. <clears throat> the effect upon the cells anywhere in the body depends solely upon the number of rads they absorb in a particular time period. C. The role of chemical similarity between elements. Certain chemical elements are grouped together because they are particularly similar to each other in chemical and hence biological properties. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium represent one such chemical group. They all end in em. <laughs> Though these elements are by no means identical in chemical or biological behavior, they do show numerous marked similarities in properties, including the way living things use them in their bodies. Potassium is a prominent vital constituent. Oops, let me see this. I'll do that again. Potassium is a prominent vital constituent of the interior of every living human cell. Fish living in fresh water where the con concentration of potassium is very low may be forced to concentrate the potassium a thousandfold in order to maintain the concentration necessary to sustain life. Because cesium is chemically quite similar to potassium, the same mechanism also concentrates cesium from such water source from a fresh water source approximately a thousand times. If the cesium in the fresh water happens to be radioactive cesium-137 from a nuclear reactor or other source, then the fish will contain a thousand times more cesium-137 than the fresh water itself on the weight for weight basis. Wow. That's why they're finding cesium-137, because the fish just naturally concentrate it. These motherfuckers knew this information a long time ago, and they still have, they're still going ahead with their motherfucking plans. Back to the book. <coughs> here, so here is an illustration of how the remarkable similarities in behavior of certain chemical elements can lead to massive concentration of radioactive substances in living tissues over that existing in the inanimate environment. This can be very serious, not because the particular radioactive nuclide is different from such others, but because concentration through such mechanism finally leads to a high dose in rads to the tissues exposed. Drinking the water might expose one to very little radiation. Eating fish from that water would expose one to a thousand times more cesium-137 radiation on a weight-for-weight -weight basis, which is why we cannot eat fish anymore. D, the role of half-life of the radioactive nuclide. Some of the radioactive substances that occur as a result of nuclear fission in a nuclear reactor are extremely unstable. Half of the radionuclide, de half of the radionuclide decaying or disintegrating in a matter of seconds. In contrast, radioactive strontium-90 has a half-life of 25 years. Radioactive cesium-137, a half-life of 33 years. But what counts in terms of biological injury to living beings is the number of rads absorbed in a tissue per unit time, not the half-life of the particular radioactive nuclide, which is irradiating the tissue. 
Thus, 10 rads from a radionuclide having a half-life of 2 seconds is the same as 10 rads from a radionuclide of 30 years half-life. However, there is an important difference between the very short-lived radioactive element and the very long-lived one in terms of potential harm. For the short-lived nuclide, 10 rads delivered in the course of 5 minutes may be all the radiation that will ever be received by the tissue, simply because essentially all the radioactive atoms in that radionuclide have decayed away. <clears throat> However, for the long-lived radionuclide, not only can it deliver 10 rads in the course of 5 minutes, but it can continue to deliver this amount, or nearly this amount, of radiation every 5 minutes for years and years. This is the essence of the difference in potential hazard for long-lived versus short-lived radionuclides. Rad for rad, however, they are identical. Another way that half-life of the radionuclide becomes important for biological reasons concerns the chance it has to get out of a nuclear power facility in time to do biological harm. If a radionuclide has a half-life measured in seconds, it is clear that it can be contained for an hour before being released. Essentially, all of... I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. If a radionuclide has a half-life measured in seconds, it is clear that if it can be contained for an hour before being released, essentially all of it is gone before reaching any living tissue. On the other hand, radiostrontium-90 strontium or cesium-137 have half-lives of the order of 25 to 35 years. Not only must we worry about them getting out of a nuclear reactor, we must worry about them for several centuries. Such radioactive elements must be kept from intersecting with living things, man in particular, at the reactor, during spent fuel transportation, and at the fuel reprocessing plant. And finally, the highly radioactive waste must be guarded for something like 500 years. When a radionuclide has a half-life of 30 years, an appreciable amount of radioactivity will persist several hundred years. Wow. Okay, I'm going to stop. We're on page 56. I can't even see the clock without my glasses because it's all too white back there. 1256. Okay. So that's a kind of a long reading. Um, if you guys want to tell me in your comments if you think that the 10 minute, 12 minute, 5 minute, what's your preference for how long you'd like me to read, it, that would really help. Because I know there's only a small group of people that are actually following these readings. And I'm reading it, I really started reading it for Fix It Stupid, uh, my friend George. And so I'm going to continue reading. I think it's a great idea. But I'd like your feedback. And please do, please, please, please do call the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or make a comment and call your elected officials and tell them we do not want more nuclear power plants in our country. Uh, even, you know, we can cancel the deals so they don't have to go through if we put enough public pressure on them. I'll end here, you guys. Um, for goodness sakes, you know what I'm going to say? Put your courage feet on. We certainly need them. Ciao.